which depend causally upon some others, and so on. And that there need exist no object or being that is independent in the sense defined above. Uh, notice that this criticism of the causal argument for the existence of God really rests on the claim that the metaphysical conclusions that there must be a first cause cannot be drawn from what we can or cannot imagine, such as an infinite series of events. It is true that we cannot imagine, that is to say that we cannot form a picture in our minds of, a world in which every event is caused by a preceding event that is caused by a preceding event ad infinitum that is without a first event to set the whole thing in motion but our inability to imagine such a world does not mean that we cannot understand it perfectly well for example consider the set of all positive and negative integers you have set i which goes on to negative 3 negative 2 negative 1 0 1 2 3 and so on ad infinitum set i it is a set consisting of an infinite number of members with no first member and no last member. No one can picture the set in its entirety, yet this set and all its properties are completely understood mathematically. This illustrates a general principle in Spinoza's philosophy, that our ability to understand is not limited by our ability to picture, and vice versa. We can understand many things that we cannot imagine, where imagine means here to picture in the mind or to form an image in the mind. And conversely, we can imagine many things that we uh, that cannot be understood. So let us return now to the causal argument. We have concluded that our inability to picture a world with no first cause does not mean that the world cannot be conceived in this way. Let us then conceive of such a world. We have set W, where W is the world, uh, we have a chain of causes, which C causes B, which causes A, which causes something else, and so on. This is a world in which everything that, is, that uh, is, depends upon something other than itself. Now, this conception of the world is supposed to show that the so-called causal argument for the existence of God fails, that the world could be an infinite series of dependent beings, and therefore the concept of an independent being is not needed. However, we will show that this conception of the world, far from rendering the concept of an independent being unnecessary, actually requires it. For the very con conception of the world as a series of dependent beings or dependent events makes it possible to talk about the series as a whole, in much the same way that one can talk about the set of all numbers. And just as the set of all numbers, set I, has properties different from those of its members, so also the series, it says in set W, of dependent events will have properties quite different from those of any of its members. In fact, a little reflection will show that W has all the properties usually associated with God. Clearly, W cannot depend for its existence on anything outside of itself, because there is nothing outside of itself. Thus, its existence depends only on itself, and W satisfies the concept of independent being. Does W exist in time? Is it temporal? Or is W outside time and eternal? Clearly, only individual members of W can be in time. W as a whole exists outside time, yet includes time within itself. Does W exist necessarily or contingently? Since there is nothing external to W, there is nothing upon which W's existence could be contingent. Hence, W exists necessarily. From the conception of W includes everything that is, past, present, and future, mental and physical, and anything else, if there be anything else. We have thus arrived at the concept of an independent being, a being that includes within itself all dependent beings, such as ourselves, a being whose existence is self-caused, eternal, and uh, necessary and necessary. Uh, we cannot form an image of such a being, but we can understand the concept perfectly well. Now let us return to the Judeo-Christian concept of God, contrasting it with the present Spinozistic conception. Under the Judeo-Christian conception, God is an independent being wholly other than the world or, or anything within the world. What is wrong with such a conception, and why is Spinoza's concept, uh, conception more adequate? 
In the first place, Spinoza's conception is, is simpler. For according to the Judeo-Christian conception, there is a God and there is the world. Whereas according to Spinoza's conception, there is only God, everything else being included in the being of God. A deeper problem within the Judeo-Christian conception is that it is not fully consistent. For consider the following question. Does the fact of the world's existence or the existence of anything within the world have any effect on God? If we answer yes to this question, then God is no longer an independent being, since her nature is held to be affected by and hence dependent upon the world. For example, if God is thought to be pleased or displeased by anything we do, and if we are regarded as existing external to God, then God's mood, so to speak, depends upon our actions, which are believed to be external to God, and hence God no longer satisfies the concept of independent being. So if God is to be wholly other than the world, and is also to be an independent being, then there can be no interaction between God and the world. Indeed, God cannot even be said to have knowledge of the world, because such knowledge would alter his state of mind, and hence his state of mind would depend on both the existence and the nature of the world. If, for example, we imagine that God creates the world in time, then God's state of mind would have to be different before and after creation. Just as when we now perceive something that formerly was not present, and so our state of mind depends upon the object we see, so God, after creation, would perceive a world that was formerly not present, and hence his state of mind would depend upon the existence of something external to her, the world. Now, it may be objected that one thing may be independent of another thing and still be affected by it, so that God could be affected by the world and still be independent of it. This is a more popular conception of independent being, and it allows us to think of ourselves as independent beings who are merely affected by, but not dependent on, our interactions with other beings and objects external to ourselves. But if we keep our understanding fixed on the definition of an ind independent being as a being whose existence and nature depends only on itself and nothing external to itself, then it is quite apparent that only the world as a whole satisfies this definition. For the, con for the contents of God's mind must surely be a part of his nature, and if those contents are different from and after the creation of the world, then so is God's nature different. Hence, God's nature is made to depend on the existence of a world external to himself, and therefore God, conceived as wholly other than the world, cannot be regarded as an independent being, that is, a being whose existence and nature depend only on herself. Furthermore, it is difficult to understand why God, conceived as wholly other than the world, would ever create the world in the first place. The principle of sufficient reason tells us that there must be some reason why the world exists rather than doesn't exist, and that, it, and that since the world is not the cause of its own existence, this reason must be external to the world, that is, it must lie in God. But it is hard to understand why God would have any reason for creating the world. All the reasons usually given, that God was lonely, or that he had some inner need for desire, they contradict the concept of God as independent and self-sufficient and are merely anthropomorphic projections of the motivation we human beings have for doing things. And since God can have no reason for creating the world, the existence of the world appears arbitrary and without meaning.